Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day four of Airport Safety Week. Uh, today's theme is safety management systems. Um, I'm sure everybody will agree a very important um, and very valuable topic for today. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Sam Leighton. I am the Regional Airports Manager and Industry Development Manager here at the AAA. Uh, as most of you will know, a safety management system is a comprehensive management system designed to manage safety elements in the workplace. It includes policy, objectives, plans, procedures, organisation, responsibilities and other measures. The SMS is used in industries that manage significant safety risks, including aviation. While the Civil Aviation Authority requires some aerodromes to have an SMS in place, all organisations that operate airside should have an SMS. For more information on safety management systems, you can uh, visit the AAA website and download uh, today's daily resources. Also make sure you follow AAA on social media to take part in the airport photo competition of the day and share your images and videos using hashtag ASW2020. We also have a daily quiz which was launched as part of our Airport Safety Week daily updates. You could have the chance to win a $100 Visa gift card. Just make sure you register uh, to participate in Airport Safety Week and complete the quiz um, and email safetyweek at airports.asn.au. So now I'm going to introduce uh, today's webinar, which of course is Safety Management Systems. And I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter, Mark Roberts, Safety Performance Management Specialist, Coordination and Safety Systems at CASA. Following 10 years in the Royal Australian Navy, predominantly with the Fleet Air Arm, Mark spent eight years working in safety and training management roles within Charter, RPT, maintenance and offshore helicopter organisations in WA. Mark joined CASA in 2018 as a safety performance management specialist, providing expert SMS and state safety program advice to CASA and industry. Mark also represents Australia on the Asia Pacific Regional Aviation Safety Team and delivers SSP and risk management training globally on behalf of ICAO. Welcome Mark and thank you for taking the time to present today. Thank you, Sam. Just set up my screen there. Okay, and thank you very much, Sam, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone, and good afternoon to those uh, that are joining us from New Zealand. Uh, thanks, before I start today, I just wanted to thank uh, certainly the Australian Airports Association and the New Zealand Airports Association for hosting this, the 2020 Airport Safety Week, uh, and certainly thank them for the opportunity to deliver this webinar today. As Sam said, uh, today I want to take the opportunity to discuss safety management systems, um, but as a lot of you I'm sure will know, it's obviously it's not just SMS, but it's also uh, risk management programs as well. Uh, I want to discuss both aspects, uh, the respective regulatory requirements for both, uh, and most importantly, I guess the common purpose behind both. Um, while they're separate, I guess, in, in title, um, and separate certainly in requirements, there's definitely a, a common purpose around both in, in terms of what it's seeking, they're seeking to achieve. Uh, also touch briefly on, I guess, some of my thoughts and suggestions on, on how best to, to manage and potentially implement uh, risk management plans and safety management systems, uh, particularly for aerodromes. Uh, and finally, I'll touch on CAS's SMS and risk management plan uh, evaluation methods. Uh, and, and what the expectations from CASA will be moving forward with regards to both SMS and RMP. All right, to kick off, I guess I'll ask the, uh, the first question really, um, which is around who needs to manage risk. Now, if I bring up my next schematic, um, this I guess is a, is a breakdown of CASA's regulatory requirements when it comes to, to safety management systems or risk management plans. So you can see from here that those certified aerodromes conducting international operations obviously have to have a, a mandate or a mandated to have a safety management system uh, and it has slightly different requirements and I'll go into that in a bit more detail later on um, but really it's that international type SMS so it's the ICAO compliant SMS is the, is the title that's been used. For other certified aerodromes, so those domestic ones that, that aren't doing any scheduled international operations. Uh, obviously it's a movements requirement there as to uh, what drives the need for a, a risk management plan versus an SMS. For those aerodromes above 
50,000 passengers, uh, air transport passengers a year, or 100,000 uh, aircraft movements a year. Obviously, that's again, it's a mandated for a domestic SMS, which again is similar, um, but slightly different in terms of the requirements within the actual MOS itself. Below that, um, any any domestic certified aerodrome with greater than 25,000 air transport passenger movements or 20,000 aircraft movements is actually mandated to have a risk management plan. And I guess anyone that doesn't fit into those categories, uh, as Sam mentioned at the start, is really recommended to have a safety management system, although it's not mandated from CASA's perspective. So, I mean, I take a step back. Obviously, these these are the new requirements that have come out uh, recently with the the new CASA 139 and the new MOS that's associated with that. The reality is, though, that the requirement to manage risk is not actually a new thing outside of the CASA world and and obviously most people might think that because I'm with CASA I don't realise there's a world outside of CASA but I certainly do uh, and I know my time in industry um, led me to understand the different sort of directions that you pulled with regards to regulations. Um, certainly in the WHS space which from a safety perspective in some regards is similar to, to what CASA is trying to achieve. These regs in most states date back at least 25 years and they have similar requirements around risk management. Um, so if we look at sort of the national Queensland type regs, uh, they talk about making sure that risks are eliminated so far as practical and where they can't be eliminated to, to minimise them in other cases. Depending on, obviously it's a state-based reg, the WHS, and depending where that sits, you know, other regs talk about identifying hazards, uh, assessing hazards, uh, assessing the risks associated with those hazards. So managing risk, just because all of a sudden you have an SMS or a risk management plan requirement from CASA, it's actually not a new thing. It's something that there's been obligations for uh, elsewhere in the, in the sort of regulatory world. Um, what CAS is doing, I guess, for the first time is really, well, for the first time for some aerodromes, is setting a, a structured ex expectations around how uh, CASA expects risks to be managed. So it provides a bit more detail and a bit more structure in, in how, uh, how we'd like to see operators uh, managing those risks and considering their own safety. So kicking off with what is a safety management system, uh, Sam certainly summed it up fairly well there before. Um, really it's a stem, systemic approach to managing safety. So ICAO define it as that systemic approach, including the necessary organisational structures, accountabilities, responsibilities, policies and procedures. So if I open up a few of the dot points here, first three, there particularly, we want to be able to identify and understand our hazards and then our risks, manage those hazards and risks, and then monitor the effectiveness of how you're actually managing uh, those risks and, and those hazards. So you can see those first three of, from an SMS perspective, uh, really focused around the risk management side of it. Um, and in essence, SMS in itself is really around managing risks. It's about ensuring safety by identifying and effectively managing an organisation's risk. Elsewhere within the SMS, obviously measuring safety performance, uh, it's used effectively as a management decision-making tool as well. And importantly, uh, it really looks to drive the safety culture within an organisation. So it's about setting the right culture um, from the CEO or from the accountable manager all the way down to, to those uh, people that are out on the ramp on a daily basis, about setting the expectations and the culture around safety. Really SMS, um, from CASA's perspective, I'm sure a lot of you might have heard about uh, performance-based regulations, which is obviously um, what the new regulatory regime that CASA is transitioning gradually towards uh, is about, is performance-based regulations. SMS is really one of the linchpins around that. Uh, it allows, it gives, I guess it gives CASA greater confidence uh, that organisations are, are better able to manage uh, their safety by, by identifying and managing the risks associated with their operations. Obviously, SMS is not a unique aerodromes thing. Uh, as Sam mentioned at the start, it's certainly uh, a common feature amongst high-risk industries. Um, from Australia's perspective, certainly within the aviation uh, industry, uh, we have SMS requirements uh, for RPT airlines, both large and well, high and low capacity RPT at the moment. Uh, that's under 82 CAO 82.5 and 82.3. Um, this is currently in the process of transitioning over to what's called CASA 119 uh, and that'll actually in, expand the SMS requirements uh, to include 
what was previously Charter Airlines, uh, which so that, that charter term will no longer exist, it'll move to air transport, uh, and also sort of, you know, to offshore helicopter operators, uh, even some aerial work operators as well will have an SMS requirement. So for aerodromes, I guess the, the people that are operating into your airfield and facility uh, in the next couple of years are going to have a greatly expanded uh, SMS requirement uh, across, across many of the organisations. There's also SMS reg regulation requirements uh, across approved maintenance organisations, uh, across flight training organisations, as well as through air services and air traffic control organisations. So certainly not a unique uh, aerodromes requirement, uh, and most of the requirements are actually fairly common uh, amongst the regs. One of the things that we're looking, looking forward into the future is creating actually a common safety management reg, um, so that we, we didn't have, don't have all these different regulatory requirements across different regulations based on the operation, but we bring them together. So in terms of what is the contents of an SMS, uh, ultimately it's built around four components. Um, from an aerodrome perspective, uh, it then has uh, the 12, which are typical ICAO elements um, sitting under these components, uh, and they also have two additional from an aerodrome requirement uh, under, the, under the 139 MOS, um, and I'll go into those shortly. Um, but in terms of safety policy and objectives, so this is really looking at, at things like management commitment, so as I said, setting that culture, setting that tone as to how management commits the organisation to safety. Safety accountabilities and responsibilities um, for, for individual staff. So who, who is actually responsible for what with regards to safety. Appointing key personnel with regards to safety as well. Um, coordination of the emergency response plan. And obviously for, for some aerodromes, uh, and typically most that require the SMS certainly, that'll also mean the adoption of a, an aerodrome emergency plan as well. Component one also covers SMS documentation. Looking at component two, this is around safety risk management, and really this is focused around identifying hazards and then the processes that you have in place for safety assessment and mitigation. Component three around safety assurance, uh, firstly is around performance monitoring and measurement. So this is things like your internal assurance programs. Uh, and this is not a new thing for aerodromes, obviously part of uh, any aerodrome, really no matter what sort of operating they're doing, there's a lot of daily checks, there's any of the systems are checked, there's fuel checks, uh, there's a lot that happens anyway. So even if you don't have a, or haven't had a formal SMS in the past, particularly in the safety assurance space, you're actually doing a lot of that, that work anyway. You're doing a lot of the checks, um, which ultimately are about managing risk. Safety assurance really also covers management of change, as well as the continuous improvement of the SMS. So these are the things that, as operations change, as the, the type of things that you're doing, as the aerodrome itself can change, uh, the risks associated with your operations can also change, and it's really important to, to capture that. Finally, in safety promotion, uh, this is really around training and education uh, for, I guess, your own staff and for other aerodrome operators or users as well for the, in the broader community. Uh, and there's also safety communication as well. Um, from an aerodrome perspective, communication is certainly very important. Uh, as, as you guys know, there's a lot of stakeholders that operate on an aerodrome, um, so there's a lot of people involved in uh, the risks and activities that are done, uh, and these are all people that need to be communicated with. So if we look, obviously, as people that have read the MOS are aware, there's this, this delineation between, I guess, international and domestic safety management systems. Really, I guess, when we talk about SMS, uh, an SMS, uh, you sort of say, is an SMS is an SMS. It doesn't necessarily matter. Um, what type of operation you have, you can still have an SMS. The key thing being the scalability, the fact that one sized SMS does not fit all activities. It doesn't fit all aerodromes, the same as it doesn't fit all air operators. The SMS needs to be suitable for the size, nature and complexity of the aerodromes activities. Uh, and this is really the fundamental premise of, of any SMS. So that size, nature and complexity is really uh, one of the building blocks of a safety management system. We're not saying that you must have X and y, X, Y and Z. What we're saying is you have to have an effective system that works for you. This holds true, not just, I guess, in safety management system, but even at the next level up. So the state safety program, which is essentially uh, an SMS for a state. So for a, for a country, so Australia has the state safety program. Uh, and even at this level with, with an ICAO, again, they acknowledge that a state safety program needs to be uh, suitable for the, the nature and the complexity of, of a state. 
you can't just have a one size fits all approach. So this delineation, I guess, within within the, the MOS on international versus domestic is really just kind of, in a way is formalizing this scalability requirement. So what it does for international is it actually mandates uh, quite a few specific details um, as to what an international aerodrome must include in their SMS. Um, but the, ultimately it's the same 12 uh, elements, it's the same four components. Uh, nothing's really changed in, in that regard. Um, they are the same requirements that everyone will have. So the international requirements, just call it out in a bit more detail, but ultimately if you're a domestic uh, aerodrome and you, you've got a domestic SMS, you could still look to the international requirements and the, the requirements for the international SMS uh, and see what it is that you can implement because a lot of them uh, aren't really going to be a lot of additional effort. Um, they're just the specific requirements uh, around that. And by implementing them, you can certainly look in, and have an effective system. So shifting over to a risk management plan, uh, and, I'll, and I'll put the definition up here just because obviously a risk management plan is, is something new. It's not really a term that we've used before, uh, and nor is it a term that we actually use formally anywhere else in the aviation industry at the moment. Um, but as you can see there, it's an integrated series of documents, practices and processes that sets out the strategies and the methodologies that enables an aerodrome operator to effectively manage to an acceptable level the safety risk associated with their aerodrome's activities. Ultimately, at the end of the day, what it is, is component two of an SMS. So the same requirements that you see in an SMS for component two around hazard identification and then processes for risk assessments and mitigation processes are ultimately the same requirements that's, that's involved in a risk management plan. So ultimately, it's a bit of a subset of an SMS um, focused around uh, risk management and hazard identification, certainly. So in that sense, I guess it isn't something new necessarily. Uh, it's just allowing uh, us to, to put a bit more formal structure around that scalability. So at the smaller end, we're not saying that you need a full SMS, but what we're saying is that this risk management section of an SMS is considered fundamental. Uh, and by just implementing that part, you're certainly going a long way towards uh, effectively managing your risks. So just coming back, I guess, to that common purpose that we spoke about at the start. So SMS, risk management plan, ultimately that common purpose is around management of risk. Obviously, that's really the sole focus of a risk management plan. Um, you could argue that it's probably the sole focus of an SMS as well. But really, it's around that component two and management of risk that really fundamentally links the two together. So they're not different in that way. Um, but when it comes to looking at that component two, they're really, really the same in what we're asking for. So if we talk about in a bit more detail around some of the specifics. So obviously I've been using the term hazards and risks as we've gone through. So identifying hazards, assessing and managing risks. So I just wanted to take a bit of time to really look at the, some of the terminology and how that works. Hazard uh, is actually fairly universally accepted in terms of what people consider to be a hazard. Um, definition up here is sort of the ICAO typically standard one. It's that talking about that condition um, that contribute to an aviation safety incident. So this is looking at, at something that has the potential to cause a safety incident, has the potential to create risk. When it comes to defining risk though, risk is, is not quite as, as clear cut, I guess. When we talk about risk, and everyone talks about risk from, you know, from people on the ramp loading the bags through to management, through to, you know, I caught part of uh, the Senate estimates the other day and the senators were, were grilling my CEO, the CASA director, and they were talking of risk as well and, you know, the risk of this and have what CASA considered the risk of that. Risk is used quite generally and often it means different things. Um, if we look at a few specific definitions, you now I can talk about the predicted probability and severity of the consequence or outcome of a hazard. So it's talking about in that terms of probability and severity, which for those of you that have used risk matrices in the past, that's obviously linked into there. Uh, and we'll go into a bit more on, on matrices and that shortly. Looking outside of aviation, in the Queensland WHS space, it talks about risk being the possibility that the harm might occur when exposed to a hazard. So again, it's talking that possibility as well. 
And then ISO 31000 has a bit of a different take on it. It talks about the effect of uncertainty on objectives as being the risk. So regardless, we don't want to get wrapped around the axles about which, which risk or what definition of risk is best and, and where it sits and how it goes. Ultimately, it's about identifying those hazards and then considering the hazards in the context of your aviation activities, so the operations that happen at your aerodromes, and understanding how they can impact aviation safety. And as we'll talk to shortly, part of that is certainly looking at the possible consequences and, and the likelihoods, and it's under, about understanding what, what the potential is for that. So when it comes to aerodromes and, and identifying hazards, and particularly around managing risks, aerodromes are in a, not a unique in, position, but they're certainly in an interesting position, where often when we consider aerodrome risks, we would say, are they actually just the aerodrome's risk to own or to manage? And in a lot of cases, the answer is probably no. In a lot of cases, aerodrome hazards, so things that you can identify as a hazard around your aerodrome, don't actually become a risk until you start to introduce operating aircraft. So this is really an important thing, I think, for aerodromes, because what you need to understand is it's the operating aircraft that creates the risk out of the hazards on the aerodrome. And what this means is that they're not Generally, they're not just your risks to be able to control and that the, the aerodrome community, so the, the operators, the aircraft, the, the staff that, that work on the ramp, wherever it might be, they have a role to play in managing the risk as well. Um, so yeah, it's not just a case of necessarily just aerodromes, it's a case of understanding how the, how the hazard and how the risk impacts the aviation community. And that's part of that communication and why it's really essential. So had a really basic example, and I'm not, not going to go into a huge amount of detail here, but on the left we have a fairly clear-cut hazard, uh, being quite a large bird in this case. Um, that risk, the reason that, that aerodromes actively manage wildlife and, and manage birds is because obviously the risk is around uh, them colliding with an aircraft. In this case, obviously, you can see in quite a dramatic fashion, but ultimately the risk is around the bird strike resulting in loss of control and then the aircraft having a subsequent incident as a result of that. Subsequent consequence of that, obviously, as you're all well aware, can be, you know, loss of control, can be lead to fatalities, injuries, whatever the case may be. But I guess the important things for aerodromes to consider is too often, and I know airlines are guilty of this because I've spent time with airlines and I've spent time in different operators, and it's certainly about educating particularly management that say birds as an example, is not purely an aerodrome risk with which to manage. Ultimately, the aerodrome can control and influence some aspects of, of the hazard in this case, or of the birds, if we're talking in this example. Uh, and, you know, that can be the basic things as to, um, you know, using wildlife management plans and, and employing specialists and whatever other strategies that might be engaged. But ultimately, you can't manage all of the, the factors that are involved in, in birds becoming a bird strike. You know, things like how, where and when an aircraft operates, for example, um, can certainly impact uh, the risk of bird strikes and, the, and ultimately the consequence. So, for example, tracking over a known bird area, for example, at low level. You know, that's, if it's over an island, for example, it's known to be nesting. That's typically uh, something that the aerodrome can't control. That's, that's around you know, air traffic control. That's also around the operator. Uh, another example might be even movements time. So I know there's issues, I believe it's in cans from memory, um, so with bats at particular times of the year, particular times of the day, uh, they tend to decide to move en masse. And it usually lasts about 20 minutes or so, um, is my understanding. I haven't seen this personally. Uh, but then of course we had, there was two RPT flights. The only two for the evening were scheduled to arrive in that exact 20 minute block. So it's again, in that case, a schedule can also be a control as to how we manage the risk. Uh, otherwise, you know, severity of, of the consequence, how, how fast aircraft are flying as well, is another example of where operators control this risk. Uh, and, you know, ATC can also play a role in this. So I guess my point here, where too often people say, you know, wildlife is typically just, it's an aerodrome risk to manage. Ultimately, there are components of wildlife that needs to be managed by aerodromes. But the important thing is getting your aerodrome community together, getting your operators together, and letting them understand that this is, you know, a lot of the risks when it comes to aerodromes are not just aerodromes to bear, but they are managed from both an operator and an aerodrome perspective. 
So really engaging that aviation community is vital when it comes to risk management. So next up, uh, we're going to talk just around risk acceptability and what is an acceptable risk. So the actual uh, AC on risk management plan talks about managing risks to ALARP. And for those who don't know, ALARP is as low as reasonably practical, practicable. Um, and there's a bit of a definition there, which again comes out of the AC, where it talks about all justifiable risk reduction and control measures have been considered and implemented and any additional mitigation strategies identified cannot be justified. So really what it is, is about getting a risk down to a level um, that further controls can't be, can't be justified. Um, and that might be due to practicalities, it might be due to the, the exorbitant cost to, to reduce a control, uh, to reduce a risk only a small amount. Ultimately though, um, there's really some principles around this, and I guess that's, that's that risk control should always be implemented uh, when reasonably practical to do so. So that is that you should continue to reduce the risk as far as you much as you can, uh, I guess until the cost becomes grossly disproportionate to the benefits. And I know some of the terms there sound a bit sort of court of law like, but I guess that that's where a lot of this comes down to. So the regs are written by CASA. Uh, if if uh, things happen and and courts become involved, then obviously it's how they interpret things um, that that's really going to really going to impact it. So organisations should only really consider a risk to be acceptable when it's able to demonstrate uh, that not only have all the risk controls being considered, but they've also implemented those that are reasonably able to be implemented. Uh, and then we'll talk about acceptability criteria in a moment. Um, there's an example that, that jumps to mind, and I can't remember where this is, someone in, someone in the audience may know the example better than I do, um, but there was a regional aerodrome, uh, probably in the last 18 months to two years, that was taken to court by, uh, by a pilot, by an operator, um, who had impacted a, a kangaroo whilst landing uh, on the aerodrome. Basically, the aerodrome had a standing uh, notice in, in Ursa that there was a kangaroo hazard at the aerodrome, and the aerodrome wasn't fenced. And that was that was a known factor, it wasn't new, uh, it was an, an ongoing thing. Um, now, this this individual, obviously, his plane impacted a kangaroo and caused uh, quite significant damage to the aircraft, as you can imagine. Um, in that case, it went to court, uh, and basically the individual argued that they hadn't done the risk wasn't ALARP. They hadn't done everything that was reasonably practical to, to eliminate the risk uh, in that essentially he was saying they should have put a fence up. Now this went through the court system and the uh, judge actually ruled that no, in this case the aerodrome and the council associated with the aerodrome had done everything that was reasonably practical. Uh, in, his, in his judgment, essentially he said that uh, fencing the aerodrome would have been a grossly disproportionate, so it would have cost far more than, than the benefits would have provided. Uh, and that in that case, the crew should have been aware uh, based on the history of them operating there and the fact that the notice was there and that that was sufficient to manage the risks. So that was actually a good example. It's probably one of the, one of the examples that, that I, I can recall seeing where this has been tested in court uh, and where um, I think a, a balanced sort of finding has come out. So on that line, I guess the bottom point there, we're talking about ALARP versus what's called SFAR versus acceptable. So these are three kind of terms that are used um, to some degree interchangeably. Um, the MOS 139 requirements uses the term ALARP. Uh, for future requirements, CAS is probably moving uh, to align a bit more to ICAO and we'll talk about acceptable. Uh, and then a lot of the WHS organisations and other areas talk about SFARP, which is so far as is reasonably practical. Ultimately, it's really about that practical assessment. Um, so if you, are, if you are going around and you're able to demonstrate that you've considered all the risks and that you've implemented those that are reasonably practical, then it doesn't matter which, which one you're lining up with here, um, it's, it's certainly something that, that covers all, all aspects of the definition. So we've talked about what is acceptable, I guess then conversely, well, what would an unacceptable risk be? So a risk would be considered unacceptable, uh, basically where you haven't considered all the controls, or where you have considered the controls and you've chosen not to implement something that, that was reasonably practical to do so. Um, so yeah, it's just really that, that converse, obviously objecting position. So if you are, you're either acceptable or unacceptable in terms of your risk. Where a risk is considered acceptable, 
uh, and organisations should continue to monitor and review the risk as long as the risk remains relevant. So again, this is something I've seen certainly uh, in industry before, is where people have identified a risk uh, and they've done a lot of great work in, initially and they've, they've managed the risk, they've put a lot of controls in places and they've considered now the risk acceptable and then essentially the risk disappears from their risk register. And so it's like, no, we've, we've, we've managed that risk, it's now no longer required. The reality is obviously seldom do risks actually disappear, uh, but instead risks become managed uh, and therefore need an ongoing management. So that might involve an ongoing review to ensure that, that, that those risks are, continue to be acceptably managed. And that might be through things like um, you know, a cyclic review program, which may be several years in the future before you actually come back and review the risk. So what do you need to actually manage risk? So again, this is consistent with both an SMS uh, and a risk management plan. And these are the requirements that are really consistent across the two. So defining responsibilities, who actually does what? So this is about who's responsible for what within your organisation. Obviously at aerodromes, you know, depending on the size, nature and complexity of the aerodrome, uh, this could be, you know, could be the ARO, could be the aerodrome manager, could be other people outside of the aerodrome space. Really depends on, on how large uh, and, and complex the aerodrome is. You also need a risk management process. So how do we actually manage risk? This process is probably, I'd see this more of a cycle, and, and this will link back to the comment I meant before, where risks seldom disappear, they seldom go away. We've managed them, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're gone, it just means that we consider for the time being that they're effectively managed. So looking at a risk cycle, um, the sort of steps that you'd need, communication and consultant, consultation initially. Um, I've mentioned this a few times already today, uh, aerodromes particularly, you know, you're not dealing with risk in isolation, you really need to consider uh, who else is involved in, in the risk, uh, engage your aerodrome community and, and keep them engaged as you manage these risks. Identifying hazards, so how you might identify these, so this might be, you know, it might be defect reports, it might be uh, safety reports, a safety reporting system that you've established, uh, it might be through brainstorming or things like that. Assess the risks, so this is I guess where you're defining your risk assessment methodology. So how are you actually going to assess a risk? Are you going to use a typical matrix, which is likelihood consequence, or are you going to use something a bit more, uh, something a little more uh, different, I guess, in terms of you know, maybe a bow tie, you might use a bow tie uh, software to actually record and, and manage your risks. With this as well, you then have to define your acceptability criteria. So as an organisation, what do we consider to be acceptable? What sort of risks are we willing to accept and what risks are we not? So you define some criteria around that. This would also include identifying your controls and really looking at the, how the effectiveness of the current controls are. So considering how effective a control is at managing the risk. You also want the ability to implement or identify and implement any further controls that are needed. Uh, and again, if you've identified that we need five new controls, um, then you probably want the ability to be able to track that through as well. So we've got these five controls how are we going to make sure that we actually implement those and that they're implemented as we intended uh, when we first considered the risk. And then as I mentioned, it's about an ongoing review. So we record this in a risk register uh, and a risk register really doesn't have to be complex. Uh, it can be quite quite basic, it can be an Excel spreadsheet uh, with, with a series of columns. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything more than that. But what it has to do is make sure it records the risks uh, and the record of the risk assessment that's been done. And importantly, those risks that are considered ALARP don't just vanish from a register. Uh, the only time you might delete a risk from a, a risk register might be if it was, let's say it was a specific risk around, I don't know, 747 operations at the airport, for example. 747 is now not operating within, within Australia, therefore that might be an appropriate risk to actually remove from the register. But more general, generic risks, more general risks, are less likely to be removed from the register. So as part of an ongoing review process as well, um, you know, we get to a point where we decide that risk is ALARP, we've done everything reasonably practicable. Uh, what we need to do is make sure that it continues to stay that way. So you know, in, in, in a set period's time, it would be depending on the level of risk often, uh, whether it be six months, nine months, a year, two years, we might come back and revisit 
that risk, particularly focusing on those controls. So are the controls still valid? Uh, are they still, is it still reasonably practical to not have other controls? Has there been new technology or, or, or new requirements that have been put in place that you could actually reduce the risk further? Um, these are the sort of things that you'd be including in, in, a, in a review. Often we'd hope that things like change management for those that have SMS would capture any changes so that would impact the risks. So that would be a, a sort of a on-demand type review. Um, but in the case of where there hasn't been changes, it's that cyclic review process that hopefully would capture the need for it. So in terms of how you go about implementing your safety management system or your, or your risk management plan, depending on your requirements, I guess the first thing to do is really understand where you actually sit in the regulatory spectrum. So that, that first slide that I brought up, uh, and obviously the guidance that's there in the MOS, where do you actually sit there? What is your regulatory requirement? Are you required to have nothing? Are you required to have a risk management plan? Are you required to have a domestic or international safety management system? That's the first step. I guess the second step then is to consider, well, just because the reg doesn't say you have to have an SMS or it doesn't say that you have to have an international SMS, would it make sense from your perspective to have one? You know, they might be considering future operations. Are you, is your aerodrome looking at changing what they do in the future, uh, you know, growing business uh, and that sort of thing? What would be the extra cost involved uh, instead of you know, potentially having an SMS instead of a risk management plan, considering how, how that cost might impact you? Um, particularly the, the, that line between the international and domestic or the fully ICAO compliant and the Australianised sort of SMS, there's really not much extra effort there. Uh, it's a bit of a refinement of procedures, um, but some of the benefits of that procedural refinement can be significant. Uh, it can also better position the organisation and the aerodrome for future operations as well. And often there wouldn't be a significant cost associated with, with transitioning from sort of that one to the, to the next. So that's certainly again something to consider. What is that extra effort? Is it worth going above and beyond what the regulatory requirements actually set? Other side, you know, the other reasons why you might choose to have it. So as I mentioned at the start, um, through CASA 119, there's going to be a significant number of, air, of aircraft operators that are going to be required to have SMS for the first time. So if you think at the moment uh, for air operators, those that are, have a regulatory obligation to have an SMS, um, essentially uh, high capacity and low capacity RPT, which at a pluck, you know, might be about 30 or 40 different airlines within Australia, not a very big amount. For those that are in charter, so for in, currently in charter that will be transitioning to be an air transport operator under 119, that number is more like 450 different operators. Now they may not all transition, um, but there's a lot there. So there's a potential that all of these new operators are going to be talking SMS and thinking of SMS. And then they're going to be thinking around, particularly around third party contractors, they're going to have requirements. So how do they manage, how do they interact with their third party contractors, of which Aerodromes is obviously one of those. So they'll start asking questions around how the Aerodrome provides assurance. They might start coming and doing their own surveillance conceivably. Um, they may, uh, although in that case, I'd imagine a lot of them would, would rely on, on sort of third parties in terms of um, existing assurance and that sort of activity that, that occurs. But they'll also want to start asking more questions around how they interact with their, your AE, AEP, particularly if you have an aerodrome emergency plan. Uh, and these are the sorts of things that I guess, you know, if you're in that level that doesn't actually require an AEP, but you have a lot of operators, you have operators that, that do require an SMS, and that's where that difference is going to sit. So again, it could be beneficial to step up and implement some of those additional requirements, even though there's not actually a regulatory obligation to have one. Some of the key things to remember, I guess, is that it's not a set and forget thing, uh, and it isn't something that's effective overnight. So an SMS is going to take a while to implement. When you, you know, publish your manual and you say go, or you turn your system or your risk register on live, that's actually not the end of the journey. That's just you getting to the start line. And so to become effective takes takes a lot of time. Um, we're implementing a system currently at CASA uh, around managing state risks, and we've essentially got to the start line, so we've managed to develop a system and implement a system, um, but now we're just starting the, the process and, and looking at how we can better implement and better manage our risks. 
as an example, I guess coming back just to the um, those other reasons and the other regulatory requirements, while I was working uh, in WA at a charter airline at the time, um, we began thinking about RPT and transitioning to RPT, and in doing that, we, we developed and implemented a safety management system. One of the first aerodromes that we went out and actually conducted surveillance on through that SMS, um, we identified some, I'll say, quite significant issues with regards to safety, um, and basically we got to the point where continue, our continued operations weren't, weren't considered to be acceptable. So we, we weren't willing to accept the risk, uh, based on what we now knew about the aerodrome and the condition it was being kept in and, and how it was actually being managed. Now the shire that managed the aerodrome at the time charged landing fees to, to a local mine who obviously we were chartered to um, to deliver in and, and that, that mine was actually had a camp in the town as opposed to out remote and it was actually putting a large amount of money into the town uh, at, the, at the time. So they had a bit of sway. When we sat down and discussed uh, the issue with the mine, and certainly our safety concerns and our intent to cease operating, they were actually very supportive of our decision um, and subsequently quite unhappy with the Shire, as you can imagine, for not providing an aerodrome that was fit for purpose, um, given that they were paying the bill. So then we, we, we basically commenced operating to an adjacent aerodrome or the near, uh, nearest alternative aerodrome, and obviously the dollars and landing fees and all that went with it. So in that case, uh, having even a, a basic SMS that just really could have kept an eye on some of the very simple things and I went up there, I'm by no means an aerodrome expert, but obviously the things that, that were standing out to me stood out quite a mile. So you know, a simple SMS, very basic SMS could have prevent, prevented these issues and in this case, you know, would, would have certainly kept and saved some business. So integrating your risk management, um, I've mentioned size and complexity throughout. So your risk management plan, or your SMS, regardless of which you, you're having, um, it, it needs to be fit for purpose. We can't say, um, you know, that that because you've got a runway that's this long, or you've got this many flights a week, that your SMS has to look exactly like this. Um, the SMS has to be designed and, and fit for purpose. Um, it, it's a matter of understanding what that means, and then working with with your own management, uh, particularly those with broader organisations, to really integrate it. Again, for those with the smaller organisations, so particularly you know, Shire Council run aerodromes, where you know we we understand that aerodrome is not the core business of of a local council by any stretch of the imagination. It's an important asset, but it's certainly not core business. So it's about you know we don't necessarily say you have to have a completely separate system in this case if you've got a risk management plan or an SMS, but it's a case of how might you integrate your risk management plan into the broader Shire or the broader organisation. So you know, shires have those obligations under the WHS Acts that I spoke to at the start to manage their risks. So conceivably, there should be some methodology in place. How can the aerodrome inter interact act with that? Uh, how can the aerodrome's risk be captured? Um, what's the most, most efficient and easiest way for you to do that? So that that's certainly an important consideration. And that also ties into then making sure who's the most appropriate person. So if the shire happens to employ a risk management expert or a risk specialist or whatever the case might be, well, from a risk perspective, even though they don't know a lot about aerodromes, maybe they're, the, they're an important person to be part of that risk management process. The aerodrome manager or the ARO would certainly have a role to play in it uh, and, and would very be heavily involved in the risk management process. But perhaps the methodology itself might be better better managed by the sort of more broad risk management person the council employs. It's about really striking that balance and, and since every aerodrome, every, every organisation is different in that regard, there is no perfect solution. Um, but it's a case of understanding you know, the size and complexity of your aerodrome, of, of the broader organisation, including your sort of council or your shire, and, and really creating something that works for you. So, I'm considering third parties, obviously, a lot of people, and, and, and Cass is under no illusions here, and it's the same for uh, air operators, a lot of people will look to outsource the development of a risk management plan or the development of a safety management system. That can work, and we're certainly not going to say that that you can't do that. But I guess some of the important points to note here um, is that first of all, you can't outsource the actual ownership of your risk. So while you can get a contractor in to write your process and write your policy, you could even get a contractor in to actually you know, mitigate the risk or to actually you know, run the system, run the spreadsheet, run the software, whatever you might have. 
ultimately the ownership of the risk will still remain with the relevant party, be that the aerodrome manager, be it someone else in the council, whoever it might be. You cannot outsource the ownership of the risk and that's really important. So not for a second saying not to use third parties because I definitely think that they, they have value and, and certainly um, you can get a high level of expertise from someone that, that does this for a living, I guess, but uh, certainly not essential. And if you are going to, that, that first point there remains very valid. Don't You can't outsource your, your ownership. Carrying through though, if you are engaging people, certainly be part of the development process. I think the more, the, the more you can be engaged through the development process, uh, the more successful your risk management plan or your SMS is going to be. If you just look for a product that, that comes off a shelf, um, you know, here's one I wrote earlier, and plug it in, you know, there's, there's a very good chance uh, that, that that manual will be compliant. So you look, those, those third parties will write something that, that meets CAS's requirements, we'll look at it, and our inspectors will say, yep, that's fine. The problem that you'll face in the future is that when we come back to visit for an audit, be it in, you know, a year, two years, three years, however long down the track that might be, there's, there's every chance that you may not be complying with the manual then because it wasn't actually developed suitably for you, for you guys and for your own operations. So being part of that process, being part of the development from the onset is really important to make sure that what's being drafted for you is actually fit to purpose and right for you. Um, off the shelf again, you know, it comes to that scalability and complexity. So when you get an off the shelf manual, uh, like I said, it'll tick all, it might, may well tick all the boxes, uh, but if it's more complex than you need, then it's really, really not gonna be useful for you. So the important message here, I guess, is you can't outsource those risks. Um, you really need to be actively part of the development process um, for, for your own risk system or your own SMS and just make sure it's right for you and, and really fit for purpose and integrated wherever it can be. So how are we going to assess an SMS? Uh, well, first of all, I guess we're not assessing SMS, we're evaluating an SMS. Assessment implies sort of, you know, yes, no, tick, whereas evaluation and safety management system is really more of a, a sliding scale of performance. So within that, we're looking, I guess, to some degrees for compliance and, and to some aspects for performance as well. So compliance is really about confirming the process in place. So, you know, in this case, it might be you have a process around how you conduct the risk assessment. And then the performance aspect will then start to look at, well, what is the output? So is that process actually generating what it was intended to do? To do that, we use a methodology which has uh, been developed internationally um, by, by, some sort of, by working groups um, through what's called SMIG-G, which is the Safety Management International Collaboration Group. And they've developed this methodology called PSOE, which is really looking uh, you can see on the slide there, there's two stages in terms of entry control or, and then post-entry control on an ongoing basis. But it's looking that something's present. So CAS will be looking, is there evidence that a, a relevant indicator is documented uh, within the organization's SMS or RMP? Really we're looking there, is it written down? Is it, is it there? Uh, is it suitable, I guess, is the next question we're asking. And that comes back to that size, nature and complexity of the organization. So does it make sense for the operator? You haven't put something that's too simple or too complex, so it doesn't make sense. We then look at operating, so is it actually in use? Uh, is an output being achieved? Are you actually doing what you said you were going to do? Uh, and then finally, it's looking at that effectiveness, so is it useful? Um, so you might be doing what you said you were going to do, but is that the right thing? Can we make it more useful? What else can, can be looked at there? So again, we're looking to evaluate that uh, and really shifting the focus from compliance to performance. So how effective is your safety management system or your risk management plan? Initially, we'll still we'll look at that compliance and make sure you have covered off the requirements, but certainly then on an ongoing basis, it's really about performance and it's about seeking effectiveness and, and making sure that it works for your organization. So final thoughts, um, just to revisit, I guess, a few few of the key points from what I've mentioned today. Um, so yeah, no man is an island, so neither is an aerodrome. So certainly when it comes to risk, so making sure you're really consulting and engaging um, your, your aerodrome community. Um, like I mentioned, a lot of the risks aren't gonna be yours to bear alone. Uh, you'll have an important role to play in them, but so will operators, uh, so will other parts of the community. So really making sure they're engaged. Third party support. 
can work well, uh, but just make sure you understand the perils, making sure you don't want something that, that isn't fit for you. So if you are going to use them, uh, be involved in that development process uh, and make sure uh, that, you, that you're constantly uh, engaging with them. Risk assessments, so again, not setting and forgetting. So as things change, risks change. Um, so making sure that just because we've implemented the controls for a risk, it doesn't vanish, it's still an ongoing risk, unless the actual risk is, is no longer applicable due to changing operations or the nature of what's being done. So in terms of just some resources uh, before I finish up, um, there's a few there on the screen. Um, certainly the practical guides, the SMS uh, booklets that CASA published uh, has booklet 7A, which is focused on aerodrome, smaller aerodromes. But that said, all of the booklets are certainly relevant. Um, booklet, uh, I want to say three from memory, is around risk management. And again, that one particularly pertinent for those doing a risk management plan. CASA's website there as well, as well as the AC. So there's the AC there, 27 uh, on 39C 27, which is around risk management plans and AC 13916, which is around safety management plans, and that's currently under review with CASA as well. So a new one of those will come out uh, in, in the future. Finally, there's my contact details, uh, or you can contact Aviation Safety Advisors, uh, as hopefully you sort of know and are familiar with those, uh, or you can go to your CASA inspectors as well. So again, I just wanted to Thanks everyone for their time today and thanks to uh, the AAA for the opportunity to, to deliver this webinar. I think we, we have some time for questions now, if there are any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, for that presentation. Um, extremely valuable uh, considering uh, the new MOS 139 um, uh, is moving to transition over the next few months. We do have a couple of questions for you. Um, the first one is, is the RMP part of the SMS documentation? or partially fully, or does it partially fully substitute the SMS manual, which is a key document within the SMS establishment and implementation process? Okay, yeah, so I, I sort of, I think I understand the question. So basically the way that the regs work, that when you meet the certain threshold for an SMS, you have to have the full safety management system. Um, so, if you don't meet those thresholds, then you're obliged to have a risk management plan. You don't have to have both. Um, but as I've spoken through to today, if you were on the, if you had a risk management plan and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, your activity increased and you were obliged to have an SMS, basically what you could do is com your component two of your SMS, which is risk management, is probably already in, in place. That, that would meet practically all of the requirements of an SMS risk management section, and then you just have to focus on the other four components. So you don't have to have both systems in place, um, but by having an SMS, you, you inherently already have the risk management plan um, through sort of component two. Hopefully that makes Thanks sense. Thanks very much, Mark. It does. Um, the next question, um, we have a lot of compliments that have come through saying thank you for a wonderful presentation, thank you for the important information, um, very important and valuable information, so um, you've been a big hit mark, so thank you so much. Um, so you. the other question is, um, in your opinion, if the pilot had have been killed in the case study that you gave before, would the judgment had have been different? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, given that, that that's something that goes through the court, uh, I, I don't necessarily feel fully qualified to answer that question. That said, I, I don't think the outcome necessarily should drive the decisions. So it, whether, you know, the, the actual consequence, that, that is a possibility, and I guess the, the judge is aware that's a possibility. And so in my mind, if, if the judge had thought there should be more done particularly if someone could have died, uh, then then I think he would have perhaps made that in his judgment as well. So, you know, in the context of both the incident that happened and the potential, um, because that's obviously what, what certainly the ju judiciary system looks at is that that what is the, the co potential consequences. Um, I think, yeah, I think if they looked at that and thought there was something else that needed to be done, they would have made that as part of their judgment. Um, but in that case, and I thought that was a really good example because one of the first that I've seen it's not often, I guess, I, I see a lot of these kind of uh, almost grassroots kind of risk issues go through into a court case. Um, but in that case, the, the, the judgment certainly aligned with 
the, the thoughts and the, and the sort of concepts that we're developing at our level, which was reassuring. So, so hopefully there wouldn't have been, um, but I guess, yeah. And, and I guess as everyone knows, different judge on a different day maybe it got a different outcome i don't know but i guess it wasn't challenged i don't think it was escalated through any other courts you know so it was just the judgment was given and, and it was broadly accepted in that regard so thank you so much mark uh we don't have any other questions for you so at this stage i'll just say um thank you so much for putting together such a valuable presentation and taking the time to come along um, and present during airport safety week we really appreciate it um and given the amount of people that registered and attended today um it certainly is um, an extremely valuable topic for our members so thank you once again great thank you very much thank you uh, before we wrap up, um, I would just like to quickly remind everyone of some great up and coming webinar, uh, webinars over the next six weeks. The AAA is hosting an infrastructure led COVID-19 recovery webinar. This webinar is a corporate member advisory panel led initiative designed for AAA corporate members who have been heavily affected by COVID-19. The webinar will discuss current and future infrastructure and building maintenance projects, which will transform airports into transportation hubs of the future and latest innovators and trends that corporate members uh, will be implementing. Um, that has already um, proven to be quite a, a popular webinar, um, so get in quick to register for that one. Uh, the AAA also has the Women in Airports online forum. Obviously, due to COVID-19, we're not able to have uh, the in-person forum, which was such a big hit at last year's national conference on the Gold Coast. However, uh, the online forum, we already have close to 100 people registered to attend. So uh, once again, uh, extremely popular um, and, and a fantastic lineup. Um, it's being held on Wednesday, the 11th of November from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. The theme of the forum is is building resilience and empowering yourself. Um, obviously, given uh, you know 2020 has been quite a tough year, uh, extremely valuable uh, topic. Our speakers will provide uh, you with tips to build resilience, teach you the skills to empower yourself and to gain the confidence needed to take the next steps to further your career and personal goals. This online forum is guaranteed to be fast paced, engaging, thought provoking and will energise you to finish 2020 um, on a higher note um, than it certainly began. Um, if you are looking to further your network, build new relationships and learn uh, new life skills, uh, definitely register for that, uh, that forum. Um, and we would at this stage like to remind everybody that this is not a women's only event. Uh, while it is uh, highlighting uh, women in airports, uh, we do ask that our male champions come along and support uh, your female colleagues. We also have uh, the virtual national conference, which will provide a, a valuable opportunity for members to engage with virtual conference partners and experience firsthand what the future of the aviation industry will look like as we enter the post COVID-19 recovery phase. The theme of the virtual national conference is airports beyond 2020. And we will have a strong focus on recovery and what the future of airports will look like. Each week throughout the month of November, we will bring you a different theme and presenter who will bring a fresh outlook to the situation we have found ourselves in. Attendees will receive, a practic uh, will receive practical advice and, and uh, thought leadership and will have the opportunity to ask questions of our expert speakers. Uh, we have Wednesday the 4th of November from 11am until 12pm. We have presenter uh, Joseph Butler from Regional Solutions Director, uh, Jacobs. His topic will be the future of aviation, solutions to share a brave new world. On Tuesday the 17th of November, we have Tourism Australia and a panel session on recovering from a pandemic. The journey is just beginning. Uh, and that topic is tourism beyond a global pandemic. Thursday, the 26th of November, we have uh, Bernard Salt, um, who will be presenting a session that will include a virtual networking um, opportunity and further details will be released shortly. Enjoy the remainder of Airport Safety Week. Thank you so much for dialing in today. Of course, if you have any feedback, uh, feel free to email myself or my colleague, Erin uh, Livingston at events at airports.asn.au. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.